Welcome. Thanks for joining us for the 14th webinar in our series, We Believe Experiences Matter. I'm Pamela Stoppergan Gay, Senior Marketing Manager at GFK User Centric, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. Director of GFK User Centric, Mike Murphy, will be leading the discussion, highlighting the key steps to improve communication between UX designers and developers. Mike has been both a developer and designer and enjoys the challenge of designing with constraints finding the common ground between the blue sky of design and the practicalities of implementation. Assisting Mike today is Associate Director of GFK User-Centric, Martin Ho. Martin has helped companies shape and enhance the user experience on a large scale uh, B2B and B2C web applications, e-commerce sites, intranets, kiosks, point of sales, and mobile devices. He has also led design workshops with Fortune 100 companies as well as given presentations on IA and UI design at national conferences. Before I hand this over to Mike, if you have questions during the presentation, use the GoToWebinar dashboard to send them in, and I will compile them for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. I'll also be monitoring the chat window, so if there are technical issues, we will try to address those as best we can. Join the conversation today on Twitter, at UserCentricInc, using the hashtag UXLunch. Take it away, Mike. Thanks, Pam. Hi, everyone. Okay, so I'm um, just going to give us a couple of minutes of introduction, um, explain what we hope to accomplish today, and we'll we'll jump right into it. So Martin is here too, and um, we're going to take you through the, a quick intro, and then we'll we'll dive into the um, the problem we hope to talk about and some of the solutions. So why are we here? Uh, we're here to talk about usability and creating great experiences, and part of that is who we are. So. Pam talked about me and Martin, so I'm an associate director with GFK User Centric. Uh, my background is in visual design and development, so I'm not afraid to, to get my hands dirty. Um, definitely not a developer, but it's in my history, and so I've always worked pretty closely with development teams on my design projects. And Martin is here too, I'll let him say hi. Hello. Yep, so um, as, as uh, Pam has alluded to, um, one of the the lead designers um, at GFK User Centric, and um, you know, experience is really in um, both uh, B2B, B2C enterprise apps, as well as design of of uh, other interfaces in the mobile um, and point of sale space. So GFK User Centric has a variety of services that are all built around creating user experiences that are positive and improving the usability of products. So that breaks down into user research and design services. So everything from usability testing to ethnography, eye tracking, focus groups, um, through the more um, the, the, the formative process of, of information architecture, wireframe mockups, design, and of course documenting this all, um, which is part of the reason we're here today. And again, I, I mentioned that everything that we do, we try to do in a way that's going to improve the end experience for not just the users, but for the people involved in the project. Because uh, depending on the complexity of a project, uh, these things can go on for two or three years. And it's a pretty big part of our lives while we're working on it, um, particularly if you're on the development team for a, a large, extensive project. So part of our job, I think, when we help to design for these is to make life as easy and, and pleasant as possible for the development team and everyone else involved. So the, um, the basic goal today is to talk about some of the things that can be in the way of that smooth process. Um, what are the, the things that tend to go wrong when you go from the design process into development and what can we do to prevent those? So we'll talk a little bit about where there tends to be a, a gap in communications or maybe not enough detail in the deliverables, um, availability of different people at different times and schedules and how they can all play together um, for the better or worse and hopefully for the better. Okay, so... Yeah, I'll, I'll let Martin go through the, um, the overall problem and, and some of the things that, that feed into it and then we'll, we'll talk about what we can do about it. So when Mike and I uh, talked about um, you know this 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 webinar for today, I, I think that um, this this misunderstanding um, kind of sums it up in terms of some of the experiences that that 
um, our clients have had and, and that we've experienced in terms of, of um, proposing certain design elements, uh, proposing design solutions, and um, seeing that what ultimately gets developed is, is a bit different from, from what we proposed. And um, it, it's, it's a problem that I think is, is not necessarily around um, specific uh, individuals or groups, but you know, there's this idea that sometimes it feels like we're, we're shouting through a wall. We're communicating you know, through a brick wall and with developers. Um, and you know, what's also interesting is that, that sometimes, and this is a great cartoon that actually can be applied through for any product development, um, it's just about how we talk about it and how we communicate and collaborate with one another. So this actually cartoon illustrates actually differences between the customers and how they think about it, how a project leader might think about it, how um, a, a designer might might approach it, a programmer how they actually implement it, and how the business consultant or you can imagine sales describes it. Um, actually, it, it might be interesting. We we think that sometimes this might be some this this business consultant. Um, image might be something that a UI designer might actually propose um, when in reality all you need is a simple swing. I think the point of this webinar isn't to um, describe developers as, as the bad guys. In fact, if anything, um, you know, Mike and I, in our experience, understand that, that the developers are typically the, the, the ones who have the most pressure put on them in terms of time constraints and, and, and in terms of their implementation. And what we didn't want to do um, is point fingers. This is not the point of our, our discussion today. Um, but actually what we do want to do is really understand and, and talk about the user-centered design process um, in helping us understand why these gaps exist. So here you see the um, user-centric design uh, user-centered design process that involves discovery, um, and then that discovery leads into an iterative design process where uh, we develop wireframes and, and prototypes, and we validate those designs with users. Um, that then leads into screen specifications um, and the application of visual design, and ultimately development. And what what has happened in the past is that. Um, the product owner and the UX designer is the person, or are the team members who uh, are uh, are actually involved early on in terms of the initial uh, discovery, and that uh, marketing comes in certainly in the branding and graphic uh, design, and that developers sometimes come in at the very end. There we go. And this is the picture of of what has happened in the past and and, and, and I think is, is typical uh, when we hear about some pain points about you know, the end de design or the end product not actually matching with what was proposed originally. And another thing that, that sometimes happens is you've got the same basic relationships and, and roles, but this entire graph, this entire diagram is squished into one big piece because essentially everything is happening in tandem um, if the schedule requires. So you've got you know, discovery for one part happening while the other part has already been designed and is in development. And so it, it, can, it, it can get pretty crazy sometimes depending on the schedule. But what matters here is essentially sort of the, the handoff points and, and at what point different things are being defined versus built. Okay. So what, what, is, what we often find is that developers are, are often the most disconnected um, piece of the puzzle. You know, that, that this gap exists really because um, it's it's not that you know developers um, aren't aren't necessarily part of a, a critical piece of the puzzle, but they oftentimes come in at the end or at, after uh, designs have already been proposed. So, what can result from this gap? And 
I apologize for the pause. It looks like there's a little bit of a delay in the slides. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay. So some examples, right? What 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 does it actually look like? What have we what have we seen as examples? Um, you know, here is one, and, and this screenshot is not in the actual application. This is just from from an image Google image search, but. Um, it, there was an interface where uh, if you wanted to re-enter uh, a search term, um, it had this uh, look and feel, and yet when it was implemented, users actually had to click on the X uh, to clear the search term and then click in the search bar to re-enter there or enter in another search term, right? So, you know, from, from a wireframe standpoint in design, um, I, you know, the intent was likely to simply... Um, offer a, uh, a method by which you can clear a search term uh, in full, but not necessarily require that extra step of, of pressing uh, the X button before entering a search term. And this is just one of those cases where in the pressures of development, probably somebody had a mock-up and this is exactly how it looked in the mock-up and they figured, okay, that's supposed to be hint text and you know, for one reason or another, maybe the, the, the hint text functionality didn't get implemented or wasn't described effectively. So um, a lot of times it can come down to fidelity in the mock-ups that you're working with as a developer. There's only so much information you have to go on and you need to guess the intent. Um, here's another example where um, it's, a, it's a filter option and um, this is one where uh, users uh, actually had to, have to click on the fourth radio button in order to enter a user's name and um, you know, the, the intent was really for users to be able to automatically click in um, entering a, a user's name and, and the radio button be selected. And as Mike had alluded to, um, this could be, you know, certainly due to uh, a lack of fidelity or specificity in, in what was provided to developers. But again, in terms of what you see and how it actually ends up working, um, that's where some of the gaps um, exist from, from design to implementation. Another uh, example common, common place we see these gaps uh, manifest themselves are in error messages. Um, you know, they can be too vague or too technical, and and you know, that sometimes when left to uh, the interpretation and specification for uh, on behalf of developers, um, you know, these messages can be quite technical, um, as you see here in terms of a line 715 not meaning anything to the user, um, or very vague in terms of not offering the user enough information. Um, so, you know, again, this is one where uh, specificity and, and even some copy editing on behalf of the, uh, the design team uh, can provide some uh, clarification as to the type of error messages that should be displayed. And also keeping, keeping the design team involved while the development team is going through the throes of, of fleshing things out because some of these cases might be um, but just because errors were not anticipated and so they came up during development, oh look at that, okay, so we need a we need a new error message for this and it gets logged, but maybe the right people are not still involved that late in the process and so it's logged but the priority isn't there to get those all written and so some of them end up going out into production like this. Okay. Um, and here's another example where dynamic resizing of, of which it's actually ended up pushing key infographics below a page fold um, and actually um, it, you know these infographics were not meant to stack as you see here but actually toggle um, between key chart views um, but again in, in terms of implementation uh, the design actually had the widgets um, placed beside the, the first you know this this widget here as you see up above the page fold and because of dynamic resizing, it was actually pushed below the page fold, um, as you see here. But I think the more uh, the more kind of difficult or complex um, problems that arise, these gaps, um, you know, what what we've discussed are things that are relatively simple fixes. Uh, but the ones that we really see as being the most disruptive are the ones where partial implementation occurs. 
and there are certainly dependencies um, and interdependencies of of inter, you know, user interactions and page elements that really provide for the complete user experience. And so sometimes what is, ends up happening is through this partial implementation, you know, this elegant spider web actually ends up looking a little bit like this in terms of the user experience. And those are the times where uh, the, these, uh, the gap needs to be minimized uh, in terms of maintaining that, that certain level of, of user experience that we're designing for. And a lot of times this can be chalked up to uh, unanticipated design needs. So it, it, what we often do is design for sort of the, the blue sky model, you know, the ideal scenario, and then work with the business to define what's, pr what's practical for release one. And sometimes due to time pressure, if that definition of what's going to be in release one happens too quickly and there isn't time to update designs based on that, the development team is left making some pretty difficult decisions on how to present things given that certain pieces have been pulled out of the overall picture. And so a lot of those can require a designer's eye and oftentimes business involvement um, to make sure that everything still creates a smooth experience. So, you know, it can even just be intentional reduction of scope that leads to these unanticipated experience problems. So what is the ideal situation? You know, what, what, what have we found to be successful? And, you know, in our discussions, uh, when Mike and I were talking, we, we, we really think that the most successful engagements that we've had are the ones that have had the highest degree of collaboration. Um, and that this mantra of involving, you know, we often in, in the usability world say involve users early and often. I think that um, it, it goes uh, similarly that you know, involving developers early and often also lead to project success. So what does that look like in terms of, you know, where do developers, where should developers fit in and, and what level of collaboration should we have between the, the UX designer and developer? Well, when we go back to our UCD model, our user-centered design model, we had the, we had the, the discovery um, as the first kind of step in the process. And, and certainly the first activity that we have with our customers, our clients, are, is, is a kickoff meeting. And what we really try to push for is that the attendees not only include product owner, managers, stakeholders, um, but that they include um, folks from the marketing side of the business as well as the developers. And in terms of the developer's role, uh, we really see this as, as a critical uh, piece of or part of the kickoff meeting. Uh, we really look to the developer to describe the current technical environments and or the constraints. Um, we look to them to identify features and functions that are limited by current technical environment um, and, and really are looking to understand, um, have them understand what the stakeholder objectives are and um, have them start thinking about the impact to the current backend system. Or systems. And there are occasionally situations where early in the project maybe the, um, the details of the development team haven't been fleshed out. Uh, sometimes when we start designing for a new system or application, the, the development team maybe isn't even selected yet. Maybe a development vendor hasn't been selected. And so while that's not ideal, obviously, the important thing is to acknowledge the fact that this important piece is being left out of the kickoff and hold another um, or several ramp up sessions as soon as possible when the developer is chosen to get the developer onboarded with the design process and the requirements process um, so that they can be deep in the picture as soon as possible and, and you know as close to this ideal as possible. So as we move forward in the, the user-centered design process, we go through this iterative uh, process of, of design and, and design validation. Uh, we also conduct user research in the discovery phase. And in terms of the attendees, again, we, we really push for um, the attendees to include, again, the product owner, manager, stakeholders, developers, and of course, us, the, the UX designer. Um, and we also have marketing communications, but you know, when we actually think about you know, the criticality of, of attendees, the developers, we, we really put 
up in terms of, of, of being a key uh, attendee. And really the role for them is, is for developers is, is to hear and see firsthand you know, what are the pain points and areas of opportunities for, say, an existing um, a product or potentially um, what are the users' needs or wants or expectations? You know, how do they think about the different tasks and, and different things that they want to uh, do with a, a certain product? Um, you know, what type of workflows um, are they expecting in terms of completing some critical tasks? And having the developer in the back room, in the observation room, uh, really gives them that first-hand understanding and context for, for why this is important from the vantage point of the user experience. It may also help to identify places where if there needs to be a little bit of compromise down the line due to unanticipated technical difficulties, that maybe there is some wiggle room here and there. Maybe there are parts of the interaction that are really quarter cases or uh, the users that tend to end up in those places are, are more power users, and so it can be helpful to find those opportunities too. We also have design review meetings, um, and uh, again, the question of who attends those design review meetings, um, product owner managers, but again, developers, uh, we believe, are, are key uh, attendees for design review meetings. And the reason is we see, you know, we, we believe the developer's role is to really assess the feasibility of implementation. Okay. And if you're wondering, yes, the picture represents, you know, how our design review, review meetings typically, <laughs> typically go. Okay. Um, another thing that, that the development team can do, and I, Martin actually, correct me if there are bullets hidden here, but um, the, you can reveal unexpected holes in the thinking of, of the design team. So in other words, if we're designing a table that presents a certain type of information, but as a developer you know that, well, the database we pull this information from sometimes has it in one format and sometimes in another. We didn't know that. That can come out early in a design review when you say, hey, wait a minute, this, this format's not going to work with our data. We need to correct this. And so we don't end up providing a design that doesn't fit the, the data model. Right. Yeah, and, and I think that, that one of the, the biggest insights that we, we've gained from our experience um, in, in this domain is that implementation is not actually a yes-no question, and, and it's actually oftentimes a yes-maybe type of question. And so in terms of implementation, if we propose a design uh, solution and it's certainly possible, then great. That's, that's perfect. But for, other, for, for when it's a no, and, and what we say it's actually a maybe, this is really where developers are critical in assessing the time and effort it actually would take to implement. And that estimate of time and effort really allows product owners and managers as well as stakeholders to determine priorities based on that and, and, and really take into balance, you know, what is the impact of the user experience and in balance with the time and effort needed to implement a certain, say, a certain interaction or um, restructuring certain uh, back-end databases to uh, be able to uh, carry out uh, a certain um, a system behavior. And, you know, one of the things that we've seen actually is that this maybe has, off, has sometimes actually been the number one, become the number one priority, become the number one priority in, um, you know, for that project because of the impact of the user experience. But without the estimate of the time and effort, um, you know, this is, it tends to be, well, it's possible or it's not possible. Okay. And, you know, we talk about developers then being involved early and often. We talk about their involvement in, in the kickoff meeting, you know, their involvement in observations of hearing, you know, what users actually have to say and, and, and understanding at the user's point of view, um, and also certainly being part of the design review meetings. And it, this is really all around allowing developers to understand the design intent. And by understanding the design intent, developers, we feel, have that context for why implementation might require some extra time and effort that will yield great user experiences. And, 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 and really the point here is that 
you know, it, it's not always the simplest path in terms of implementation, but uh, without understanding, again, the context and, and the design intent, uh, you know, this is, we believe, this is one of the, the biggest sources for the gaps that exist between proposed design and, and final implementation. And yet the reality is, is I think everyone uh, listening and attending today uh, understand is that not all projects follow this ideal path, right? And so artifacts, uh, these design documentation actually help bridge the gap between UX designers and developers. And even with the highest level of collaboration, um, we understand that artifacts are still required. Um, but I think the key takeaway is they, they just require less intensive documentation. And so what we wanted to do for the remainder of the webinar today is really talk through um, the different design documents that we have found to be successful. Um, and yet, uh, as Mike will talk through, um, one size doesn't necessarily fit all. So Mike. Right. Great. So there are a bunch of things that we take into account um, at the beginning of a design project and, and also later in the project to decide how are we going to document this design beyond just creating the mock-ups that are necessary to get to you know, the, the approval and the point where the business feels like everybody's getting what they need out of this design, including the users. Um, so sometimes we know these things early in the project, sometimes we don't. So often we will leave the question of design artifacts to later in the project when we know more about the development requirements. But the basic things that go into it are number one, schedule. Um, how quickly is this all happening? And how much time do we have to produce these? Some, some of the documents we'll be talking about take some real time to produce. And you know there's a trade-off. It, it's worth it in certain cases. Uh, but other times, you really need to be more agile, and you need to document things in as, in as streamlined a way as possible, especially in those tandem situations where you're working in an agile environment, designing one sprint while the next sprint is being developed. and <clears throat> so all of that has to come into play. Um, and then, of course, research can affect the, when I say research in this case, I mean user research can affect the schedule as well. How quickly do we need to get the design to a point where we can put it in front of users and usability test it? And how does that play with the development schedule? And obviously, after that test, we need time to go back and change things. So that all comes into play. Uh, the next question, or, or series of questions, has to do with the development approach. So number one, is the development team identified yet? Do we know who we're going to be working with at that point? Um, and if so, what's the, the team's availability? Can somebody from the team be involved from day one in a pretty deep way in the design process? And that person can then give the rest of the development team the context that they need. Um, you really sort of need continuity there. Uh, either that or a really strong set of internal uh, documentation practices within the development team so that that context can be carried right from early discovery where we're identifying what features are really important right through development where some of those features are you know, up against the development schedule and somebody's trying to decide do we do it this way or this easier way. Um, so availability is a big issue and, and the, the more available we make ourselves to the development team the better, but then also the more available the development team can make themselves to the design process the better. Um, UI dev specialist, what that means is does the development team have somebody dedicated to the issues that come up when you're building for a web application or if you're building a native application, the things that make the difference between something that looks generic and something that has a bit of flavor to it um, and a bit of style. And so you know, there's a big difference between implementing using the, the platform standard controls and in some cases custom controls. And for a user experience specialist or, or, or a UI developer specialist, these can be pretty easy. But for developers that are traditionally working in you know, the databases and the, the systems end of things, it's kind of a different world. So it's important to identify, does the development team have a, a real hardcore UI specialist or not? Because there are certain types of documentation that we can provide uh, 
that make up for that and, and kind of go through a lot of the details that somebody will need if they don't have that, that specialty background. And then, of course, the framework, um, what is this all being built on? Is it, is it a UI toolkit? And if so, does it give us a, a certain menu of things that we can pick and choose from and we have to stick to that? Obviously, that's critical um, because if that changes or if we don't know it and it's introduced later, it can create a real big need to redesign things, and not, not necessarily back to the drawing board, but all of a sudden you're trying to fit a complex series of screen designs into a new set of elements. Um, so the sooner we know that and can talk through it, the better. And that'll, that'll help to identify what are the best documents. Complexity. So both apparent, in other words, how many screens are we talking about, how many different usage scenarios for each of the screens, um, you know, how much is there that's going to be left to guesswork if we don't spell it out. And then underlying complexity, of course, um, we're barely going to touch on the, the need for a business analyst who goes through with different members of the business, you know, whether it's the, the marketing or the product team or the, the legal team, every single possible scenario. Um, you know, those are, there's a lot of potential complexity there that requires documentation from the perspective of the development team so that you don't have to make all of those guesses for the corner cases. And then finally, what platform is this all being built on? So if it's being built for the web, there are just certain things that we do differently certain formats that work well, some that are just more forced than is necessary. Um, if it's being built for a native application, uh, usually there's going to be a UI toolkit involved. So the sooner we know that, the better. And then, again, different types of design artifacts make more sense. And then, of course, you know, mobile or, or integrated, maybe small screen. Um, maybe the, the constraints on the UI are a lot tighter. So the more documentation we have as a design team earlier in the process, the better. And usually that means we can provide less documentation toward the end because we're building things based on the, the capabilities of the system. So with that, we're going to just kind of give you a whirlwind tour of some of the, the artifacts that can be left behind as part of the design process and which ones are going to be useful when uh, and, and some of the pros and cons. So one of the earliest artifacts, of course, is wireframe mockups, and this is just really screen drawings. Um, so as we go through the early part of the process, there are some steps that come before this where we're identifying users and scenarios, but that the first time things start to get visual in terms of um, something that a, a developer can dig their teeth into is the wireframe mockups. And occasionally, these will be the key deliverable, particularly if, if budget or schedule constraints call for it. And so the fidelity of these tends to be on the low end, um, and that could be for a number of reasons. Typically, it's just because they're quick to work with. If you keep the fidelity low, it's really fast to make changes to screens. Um, you can sketch through ideas while you're reviewing with a team and, and kind of brainstorm on the fly. So they work great for that. Uh, but then that can be a limitation when you're trying to build from them. Obviously, the, the more things look like the, the sanctioned style, the better. So maybe if there's an existing style guide and a, a visual language has already been agreed on, wireframe mockups might be sufficient if there is somewhere a style guide that shows what these elements should all look like when full polish is applied. But usually, um, we're going to take it a, a step further. So we'll talk about that next, and that'll be... Uh, mood boards and theme boards. So when we go from some from black and white line drawings, identifying layout of screens and behavior of elements and, and functionality to the visual, often rather than jumping right to design comps, there are some interim steps we can take to, to smooth the way and to, to hit closer to the mark. And the first one is these mood boards and theme boards. So the idea here is we define some of the key characteristics that we want the end design to have and visualize those in these mood boards, which are just quick mock-ups. They can be photos, textures, colors, fonts, things like that. And, and those are used as a way to decide between these three or four different moods, which one is the one that really sums up what we want to say. And, and so these are a little more appropriate maybe for design-heavy applications. So if it's a, a consumer-facing website, certainly very relevant. 
Um, if it's a, a web application, these are probably relevant. Uh, but are they relevant to the development team? Less so. Um, the only way they can be useful is that they provide an early and, and very pure glimpse into the spirit of what the design should accomplish. So if we've created a bunch of mock-ups and maybe only 10 of 50 screens make it into full design comps, we still have this mood board as a way to say, this is what we're going for. So if any new screen has to be uh, mapped into the, the, the visual design, it should be done in a way that preserves the spirit of whatever mood board was, was selected as the core of the design. But again, grain of salt. And then, of course, the, the visual design mockups are, are the big one. So once the, the behavior has been identified and the interactions have all been um, designed, sometimes uh, usability testing may have already been done. We'll talk about prototypes in a minute. Um, but so maybe before usability testing, maybe after, we're going to decide what should these things actually look like. And so that can come from a branding guide that already exists. Maybe it's a greenfield design and we're creating a look and feel from scratch. Um, the, the mood boards are going to feed into this. The selected mood board is going to define the, the direction. And then we're going to choose key screen types and apply the, the full visual to them. So for a complex system, let's say, um, a system for shopping for insurance and, and applying online. You might have 200 screens uh, when you look at all the different uh, corner cases. And, and of those, maybe 100 of them are, are mocked up as wireframes because a lot of them are just duplicates or error messages or special cases that are minor variations. And of those, maybe only 15 or 20 get mocked up as visual design because the elements are going to be the same from one screen to the next. The menu looks like a menu. All that's different is the content. So the, the higher the fidelity gets, usually the fewer of these screens there are. So one limitation of these is that because they're time consuming to create, there usually are fewer of them. They can be a great resource if you've got a, a dedicated UI specialist on the development team because that usually is a person who can dig right into a Photoshop file and pull out the colors and font settings and things that, that are needed to implement. But oftentimes, um, if that person is busy or if the development team doesn't have that person assigned, then we need to take things a step further. So prototypes, I mentioned these could happen before or after visual design. Uh, we use these mostly for usability testing. And this one in particular is one that we did for Valpac when we were designing their website. And we used Axure to build the prototype. Um, it was done from low fidelity wireframe mockups. And uh, so everything is black and white. But all the interactions worked. And we actually sat down with um, users and, and tested this. And so you know, we were able to stitch the design mockups together into a real experience for users. And sometimes that can be useful for the development team too. The, the, the prototype, and this is a word that means different things to different people. I think from a development team's perspective, a prototype is often more deeply functional than a design prototype. So from a development team's perspective, maybe the prototype uses a, a small test database with a certain amount of, of safe information that's been pre-checked for you know, errors. And so it's more functional. Uh, our prototypes for usability testing tend to be pretty static. They're not going to be hooked up to real data. Sometimes they're just image maps. You know, we'll just take the wireframes and, and link them together with hotspots. So that makes these really quick to put together and great for, for testing. But the limitation here is while they're good to provide a context and to explain what links to what and how the flow works, Essentially, it's throwaway code, usually. Um, these are not built from you know, real HTML and CSS or anything that you can reuse. Um, so it's, as, a, as a learning tool, it's useful. But ultimately, it is a disposable artifact of the design process. So that's just something to keep in mind. We don't typically update these after the test. Usually, we'll update the mockups. So prototypes tend to get outdated even though they are a very useful way to get a quick sense of what the flow looks like for an application. 
page templates. Um, so really this is HTML and CSS, and this is specific to uh, web sites or web applications, but then even for native implementation sometimes, depending on the, the front end toolkit that's being used, it's possible to provide templates, um, whether it's XAML or another format, that essentially it's a front end facade that the development team can then just take and plug the, the back end logic into. Uh, and, and what's useful about this is it's a way to take some of the burden of mapping uh, design mockups to real screens off the, off the development team and it adds a level of certainty because if the HTML and CSS page templates cover the key pages of a system or a site, then you know, A, they've been cross-browser tested, so most of the elements are going to work smoothly regardless of how somebody hits it from a browser, and, and B, um, the development team doesn't have to make as many of the decisions on how are certain things implemented, but again, uh, this is only appropriate if the development team doesn't have that, that UI specialist, so if they do, that person is probably going to want to create these templates. Again, it, it really depends on schedule and availability. And the artifact that we're showing here is the source code. What do these really look like? They look like the design mockups. You know, ultimately, they're going to look just like a mockup, except it's, it's going to tend to be in a browser. And sometimes the pages can link to each other, so there's some basic interaction. Um, sometimes we can actually create these like a prototype. So occasionally we'll do usability testing with a prototype that's real HTML and CSS, and then after the test we will actually update that based on things that we find. And that can be great because it preserves the prototype, but it's no longer throwaway code. Um, sometimes we wait until after the test, so we'll just do a quick extra prototype for the test, and then once we finalize the design, we'll, we'll build things out. So often, um, I, I would say if there's one artifact of the design process that's going to do the most to ensure that the final implementation will, will be in the spirit of the original design, this is probably it. Uh, it's, it's hard to go wrong if you've got the page templates created from the beginning. But that's not always possible. So maybe it's being built in native code um, with a UI toolkit that <coughs> doesn't accept any format that we can easily export from our design tools. So how do we document it then? And, and maybe it's not just about getting the screens and elements plugged in. Maybe it's about what are all the different states of these elements, and that's where screen specifications can come in. So a screen specification is going to tend to be a pretty lengthy document. They're, they're pretty technical. They're geared toward the, the developer's view of a system uh, and also the designer's view, in that they're structured usually by section of the application broken down into types of screens and then individual screens and then the elements of a screen. And they go into a, a great level of detail for every element. So for example, if it's a button, what are the states? When is it enabled? When is it disabled? Um, what happens when you click it if it's disabled? Is there any indication of why it's disabled? So again, these remove a lot of uncertainty that you have when you're looking at mockups because a mockup typically is only going to show one state. And a form might have 50 or 60 different combinations and permutations of, of situation, depending on what a user has entered up to that point. So a screen spec is a way to define all of the what-if scenarios. And they, they tend to be focused, again, on layout behavior, um, not so much on, on the visual design aspects of things, because those, well, there's another deliverable that we usually use for those. The drawback to the screen spec is really just it adds time to the design process. These take a bit of time to produce. Um, you know, it, it's going to be on the order of like two or three weeks usually to produce one of these. They're, they're pretty lengthy, but they're useful because they leave very little in doubt in terms of the, um, the functionality of the individual screens. So requirements documentation is sort of the next step up from this. Um, it's very similar to screen specification, and, and this is something that we're not always directly involved with, but we're often uh, 
indirectly involved with it. Usually this is something that business analysts will be working on in tandem with the design process and, and it, it becomes extremely useful to the development team because this is where we define at the high level how the realities of the business affect the, the practicalities of the user interface. So, you know, how does a particular form change depending on whether the user is under 65 or over 65? That could be huge. And so the sooner we understand things like that and have them documented, the, the sooner we realize where the complexity is. And so whether we're building the requirements documentation or whether we're working with a team that's building it, this is often a really useful tool and, and often a very necessary tool. Uh, but the drawback, of course, is this stuff takes big time to produce. The nice thing about it is the only, the only real effective way that I've seen these produced is by real deep collaboration with a lot of people from the client team. So yes, it's an investment in time, but it's a way to make sure that each group within the, the stakeholders for a product has had input and has had a chance to understand where are the complexities and, and thought about how we handle them. So they're very solid and they have a lot of authority when you can produce them. It's just a, a pretty big investment of time to get there. Sometimes absolutely necessary though because it'll save you a lot of headache down the line. Visual design specs are kind of like that, but they're focused on a different aspect of the design. Rather than being focused on the logic of the display and which elements appear and what their states are, this is really just focused on how do we render these things. Um, so in the case of a web app or a website, usually we're going to go with page templates because that's kind of like the deluxe version of a visual design spec. It, it, it saves the effort of having to go from this document format to a real format. These are more useful for native applications or sometimes mobile applications where you're using custom controls and you have to identify um, individual color codes and fonts and sometimes gradients that go in the background of elements. Uh, these are going to tend to be useful in an over-the-wall type situation. So in other words, you always want to avoid the situation where you throw the design over the wall and, and hope for the best. But sometimes that is just dictated by the way the project is happening. Um, maybe the development team hasn't been chosen yet, or maybe the development team isn't available yet because they're on another project. So you need to document things pretty deeply. Um, and, and sometimes it's, uh, it's, it can feel a little bit silly because you're putting a lot of work into a document that ultimately is not part of the, the final product. But it can be very useful if you don't have that opportunity for collaboration because then the development team can take this and go through element by element and say, okay, for this button, that's this section of the document, there we go, that's the border, that's the background, that's the background for the disabled state. So they're, they're just a very thorough way to cover all the ins and outs of the visual design. But there is sort of a happy medium. Um, so whereas a, a visual design spec um, can often get up into the, you know, 90, 100 pages range, uh, implementation notes and assets are a much quicker approach that gives a, a similar result. Um, so there's, there's less polish to them. In this example, what you're looking at is essentially just annotated mockups. Um, you take the screen mockups and overlay the types of information that somebody would if you were a designer, you'd open it up in Photoshop and you'd pull this information out like the fonts and the colors and spacing, but instead we'll just document it right over the mockups. So this is going to tend to be a document. It's similar to the, the visual design spec, but it's produced a lot more quickly, um, sort of quick and dirty if you will, and it serves its purpose pretty well usually. Sometimes um, because we don't produce these as methodically and in detail, we'll have to go back and flesh out an area or two where we might miss a little bit, but the savings in time usually justifies it. Um, you know, these are going to take probably a third the amount of time that a full visual design spec will take. And a style guide 
is, this is something, it's another one of those buzzwords that means something different to everybody you ask. Um, so I'll, I'll, for what it's worth, I'll explain what differentiates it from these other documents for us. A style guide is a way of abstracting information about an individual design so that it can be repurposed for other designs. So maybe that means you've created one application and you've got three more to create and you want them to have a consistent look and feel. So you need to go through and rather than documenting what each individual screen looks like, you need to abstract that and say, here are our types of screens. And this is what a screen for a wizard looks like. And this is what a screen for you know, data uh, presentation looks like. And so it's, it's an abstraction, uh, but it's also very detailed. It's, it often has the same level of detail as that visual design guide. And the important thing if you're going to invest in a style guide is to realize that in order for these to work, um, even though they can be time consuming to change, they really have to be living, breathing documents because you create one application, you've got a really solid visual design for it, and that's documented, it's built, everybody's happy, um, but to abstract that design and say that it's going to get you 100% of the way for another application, it's just not going to happen. The second application is going to have different requirements, it'll require elements that weren't there um, in, in the style guide initially. So this is a, it's an ongoing commitment. If you create one of these, whether that means you're going to create it as a website, like a wiki, uh, where developers and designers can contribute to it, or as a document that can be checked out and checked in, the important thing to realize is if you don't want it to just become something that collects dust, understand that it's, it's a long-term commitment to create one of these. They're great because they can allow you to give a certain level of creative freedom to people who are going off and creating new screens or new sections of an application um, with, with less oversight. But at the same time, you know, that, that convenience comes at a cost, which is just the effort of producing them. So implementation support is sort of the, uh, the duct tape that goes on the end. And, and sometimes this is really what it all boils down to. It's if we're there to help when questions come up in the development process, it's going to make things a lot easier. So maybe there isn't time in the schedule for visual design specifications or a full screen spec or page templates. But there's always time to say, you know what, we're available by phone, by email. Um, you know, whoever created the design is going to carve out a chunk of time and dedicate that to helping the development team to build this. So regardless of what those deliverables are, when there are holes in them or questions that need to be answered, the important thing is to create that, that, that lasting collaboration so that anybody on the development team knows who to go to to get a clearer and, and thorough answer from the design team. And often that's going to mean going back to the business if a, if a question has ramifications in business requirements. Um, but the, the important thing is to create that strong collaboration so that there's no intimidation and there's no sense of, oh, I don't want to do this, it's going to make it take two or three days. It all has to happen very quickly because, let's face it, if you're, you know, especially in a, a sprint type environment, there isn't time to stop and wait until you get an answer tomorrow. Um, it has to happen very quickly. And so that's something we typically build into our projects as a way to, um, to fill in the gaps. Okay. So that's the information that, that we've compiled. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of these things work uh, very well in some situations and not others. And we'd be happy to answer your questions about anything that you think we might have missed or about when some of these might make sense. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so we actually have um, just a little bit of time. Uh, I think we'll, there, there's a couple questions that did come up, I think, are, are really great questions. Um, you know, Mike, I'll have you answer this one. Um, do you worry that involving developers throughout the design process will actually stifle innovation? No, it, it's a tricky question. Um, here's the thing. Innovation doesn't get you anywhere if the design's not going to make it through development and, and the realities of technical constraint. So will it change the course of innovation? Sometimes. Uh, but, you know, any designer 
that that's that's worth their salt is going to know that sometimes you need to design within constraints, and and sometimes that can be pretty empowering to know that not only did we create a great user experience, but we did it using the tools we had available. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel to get there. Uh, so does it stifle innovation? No, I would say not. Um, but be prepared that along the way there are going to be some difficult decisions. So you will may you may come into features that are going to make a really big, uh, really big difference in the visual appeal of the application. Maybe they're going to make it feel very contemporary, but they're going to add a week to development. It happens, and so that's a tough decision. The earlier that can be made, the better, so that it can be an informed decision. And Mike, I, I would I certainly agree with what you said, and I think that. Um, oftentimes, we, you know, designers from the design side, it's about visioning out what the ideal solution would be from the user experience point of view, and then, you know, this is where developers will come in and, and really help us understand what's feasible, and um, like you said, those tough choices, those compromises will need to be made between um, time and effort to implement and kind of that ideal state um, for the user experience, and, and we, we really try to find a middle ground between um, great user experiences and, and certainly feasibility. Um, there's another question. Um, do you find that usability's final proof is in actual use, and therefore there is always a follow-on release for usability, and should we plan for this? Okay, so I'll, I'll take a shot, and you can you can add. I would say. Um, you know, we, we might call that a longitudinal uh, usability test. Uh, absolutely. So when you, when you test with a prototype, you're asking users to make a certain level of, of willing suspension of disbelief. They, they can see that what they're using is not the real thing, sometimes. And as a result, maybe they evaluate it a little bit differently. Maybe their behavior and their, their, their interpretation is going to be a little different. So we need to take that into account. And once things are built and they've been through the, the practicalities of, of what's feasible, the end result might be a little different and it might be very subtle. But some of those subtleties might be just enough to throw the balance off and send a user down the wrong path. So it, certainly if, if the budget and, and schedule can support it, it's a great idea to plan early on to, to revisit the user experience once things are built. And you know, depending on the size of the project, maybe that's done in phases, or maybe it's done after you know 1.0 release. Mm -hmm. And there's just one 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 other question. I know there there are more, um, but I thought it's worth um, bringing up for for the purposes of discussion. Um, the question is: Won't involving developers early and often, as I guess as we were promoting, um, in and of itself increase the project budget? And you know, I think that from from how you know when Mike described the different design artifacts, uh, what he was really talking about was for some of the limitations was the time intensity in terms of the you know, how much time it would actually require to develop and to provide um, different uh, artifacts. And and what we've seen is that that amount of time actually can work out to be more um, more strain on the project budget and the uh, the effort, the total effort that's that's possible, um, in in comparison to allowing you know having the developers actually involved um, earlier in the process. Okay. Um, yeah, and, I mean the, the the nice thing is the surprises come early and not you know two weeks before releases do. Right. Right. So uh, you know, unfortunately, this is the the end of our time. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, I know Mike. Uh, Appreciate, we appreciate your time. Uh, the recording of this will be available on YouTube and Vimeo.